right. Peter Chaurier, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Julie. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Peter, I found you through Twitter, and I'm reading that you're a conservation biologist. Um, you're doing your PhD at U of Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. I've been at U Ottawa for a while now. I don't like to think how long I've been here. Um, but I love the city. Uh, I love the university. And uh, yeah. Do you want to give me a bit of an idea of how long you've been in Ottawa? Yeah, I've been, oh man, this will be, I think, in September, the ninth year. Um, so I came here for my undergrad. Um, and then I started my master's. And then I fast tracked my master's into a PhD program. Um, okay. What did you do your undergrad in? It was, uh, I, I ended up switching. So I started in, in biomedical sciences and I was dead set on being, uh, on being a doctor, a medical doctor. And then partway through, um, in my second year, I took an ecology course and I was kind of, I've always had a, a really big affinity for, um, for wildlife and for nature and for camping and for being outdoors. And when I took that ecology course, all of that kind of buried passion just kind of like blew to the surface. And I was like, oh man, this is, this is what I want to do. Like, I can't, I can't sit here in anatomy, which I like, you know, don't really don't feel passionate about. I was like, I need to be, I need to be doing this. And then I switched over in my third year and I haven't looked back. Since. And now you're doing a PhD in macroecology. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm doing a, a PhD and my, my research focuses on um, kind of macroecology and conservation biology. So I, I'm interested in, in conserving species and wildlife and, and mitigating kind of all these threats that, um, that wildlife is facing now. And I do that um, using macroecology, so big scale ecology and um, big scale trends and big picture type of, type of research. Okay, before we really, really dive in, I learned something very curious about you before the <laughs> podcast recording started. I learned that you're from Northern Ontario, and so am I. So we have a bit of a Northern con connection here. And, and so why don't, you, why don't you tell everybody where you're from? Yeah, yeah. I'm always repping the 705. Um, I grew up in North Bay, Ontario. Um, beautiful country, four hours away from, uh, from Ottawa. Um, three and a half if you're driving fast, and uh, and yeah, I grew up there. I grew up being outside, going going into Algonquin, making trips to Science North and Sudbury, and um, and heading up to, to Sturgeon and to uh, to Miskin um in high school quite a bit. It's amazing because I grew up just outside of Sudbury, so we have a, a bit of of a connection. I also lived in North Bay for a year, and I mm -hmm. loved North Bay. North Bay had so much to offer in terms of nature, like you said, but it also had a beautiful little art scene. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. I think that's overlooked a lot. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's a great spot to, to grow up for sure. So you grew up, uh, did you do a lot of camping? Yeah, yeah, we were big into camping. Um, my my uh, mother's family is has been huge into camping forever. My grandfather, you know, has built canoes and kayaks. He still has a, a homemade kayak in his garage, I think, right now. Um, and uh and so we would go out with them all the time uh with my uncles and my grandpa and uh to Algonquin Park usually Lake of Two Rivers was like our go-to spot and um we would spend like weeks out there in the summer I remember in high school um you know we literally spent three weeks at one point um at Lake of Two Rivers uh, we'd have the bikes and we would just you know bike up to all the way up to Rock Lake and you know spend the day doing that picking blueberries in the airfield there um, and then doing a lot of canoeing and, and hiking as well. Did you do any fishing? Yeah, a lot of fishing. Unsuccessfully, usually. I'm a, I'm a terrible fisher, but but I love being on the lake and you know just sitting there with a with a rod in the water. It's, I'll never catch anything, but I love doing it and pretending I can. So, do you think that this um, this kind of uh, background, I guess, would does, does, does that really play a part? in your love of nature in the reason why you decided to study macroecology later on? Yeah, I think it did. I definitely think it did. I think, you know, it kind of grew this like respect in me of, of nature and uh, kind of, you know, it got me seeing kind of all of the beauty in it. Um, you know, we would hike because we would be out there so long. So we would be like on rainy days, even going out on hikes just to be able to leave the campsite. Um, and it was crazy to me like to see like, just the transformation of like of the forest or you know of a, of a meadow when it's raining um and seeing all these little differences that you know all of a sudden different animals are coming out and um 
and so I think, yeah, it really like stoked this like passion and, and love of nature for me. Um, and then when I was home, I'd always be flipping through you know, National Geographic and um, looking at, you know, BBC documentaries and whatever. And, um, and so, yeah, I think it really stoked this passion uh, that I'm so happy I can explore in some way now. Yeah, it's pretty cool to be exposed to all that when you're a kid. I mean, the forest becomes your playground, right? Yeah, exactly. Especially in North Bay when there's so much forest. It's, you know, really great to be able to run through that as a child and and just be able to explore and be curious and and see that when you're younger. Exactly. Now, then you moved to Ottawa. So coming from a more rural, let's say, community, uh, how did you adjust to living in a bigger city? Yeah, I thought it was nice. Um, I was, I was actually born in Toronto and spent, you know, my first six years there. So I don't really remember it, but it's kind of, uh, you know, we would go back and visit quite a bit. So I, I like to think I have some of that, you know, big city also in my blood, um, and uh, which I love in a, in a different way entirely. But um, Ottawa was a great kind of midpoint, I think, between like Toronto and kind of the busier cities, and uh, and then you know North Bay and. And Northern Ontario, which is very much on the other end of the spectrum. Um, so I really, I think I settled in really well in Ottawa. I had a lot of other friends that came to the university um, from North Bay at the same time. So I had a nice network and, and some other friends that I knew from, from previous jobs uh, with the Ontario Rangers. There actually ended up being a bunch of us from that program that ended up in Ottawa as well. So I really okay, enjoyed well, Ottawa. When, yeah. Well, I was going to say, hold on a second here. What are the Ontario Rangers? Oh, man. Yeah, that was... Not all people know about this uh, program, but it was like probably the best, probably my favorite ever government program um, ever. And it was uh, it was this thing where they would send 17 year olds. You would apply to this program when you were 17, the summer of like after 11th grade, and um, and then you would like, you know, if you were accepted into it, they would ship you off to this basically work camp in like the middle of the bush, and you would be stuck there with um, with 20 other um, either boys or girls. It was a kind of split, uh, you know, separate camps. And, um, and you would just work there for the whole summer with this group of like, of 20, of of 20 guys. Um, and, uh, it was just like, you know, we were there, I was, I was sent off to this camp at, in Round Lake near Pembroke. Um, and, you know, we did work in in Algonquin Park and Floyd Park. And I think we went into Bonnachere Park and we would, you know, fix trails and, maintain campsites and uh we made a boardwalk in one time in cobden it was just like you know we spent the whole summer outside doing all these kind of like jobs in nature in the parks and um it was the best summer ever it was it was really awesome that sounds like a lot of fun it's like it's like summer camp except you're getting paid for it (laughs) yeah yeah and it was like at that age when like you know you weren't allowed to go to summer you were too old for summer camps usually so it was an awesome kind of uh kind of throw back in that sense, yeah. Very cool. So again, another program that helped to shape you, I guess, in a way. Yeah, definitely. And it gave me like a whole new, I still, whenever I'm like walking on a portage or a hiking trail, I'm like, and you know, I see like a branch across it, I'll, I'll always pull it off. It's like this uh, habit now that I have uh, of just kind of cleaning the trails now. Did your family instill a specific work ethic in you? Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, in my family, we were always like, Academics was always kind of the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest thing for us, uh, the biggest priority. Um, you know, you hear that a lot, like with uh, with uh, kind of immigrant families as well. Like, you know, my dad immigrated from Nigeria when he was younger for university, um, and so he like really instilled. And, and my mom is a teacher as well. Her father immigrated from from Britain, and so um, you know, we always had this like really big push towards, you know, academics and like. You know, my family was, my parents were really great for like pushing us into sports as well and a lot of outdoor activities to, to make us well well, well rounded. Um, But it was always like the biggest thing was like, you know, you need to finish your homework. You need to like finish school, um, schoolwork first. And I'm really happy I have that because that was really helpful in university for like keeping me disciplined and and keeping me on track for that. Interesting. And did you have any time period in your youth where you rebelled or anything? Like, did you... (laughs) You know, when you have a family, my family was also very hard on, on me academically, um, mm-hmm. but I pushed back a lot. Did you, were you like that a little bit too? I, I definitely was. I mean, we got up to some incredible shenanigans in high school. Uh, you know, I had a good group of, of friends, but uh, we definitely like 
got up to a lot of trouble, some of which my parents know of, a lot of which they don't. A lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of kind of you know wild high school um, nights uh, and parties. Um, but we were also like, you know, I remember one story that you know my mom will always still tell uh, and threatens me with, but we in a high school lab, in a high school chemistry lab, we were doing this experiment with copper sulfate. And um, me and another one of my friends thought it would be funny. It looked like blue Kool-Aid. And so we were like, oh man, that would be so funny if we drank it. And then, you know, this was, I guess I rebelled in like very specific ways of doing very stupid things. And, um, and so we like ended up doing like a quick sip of this copper sulfate each. And it was absolutely the most disgusting thing. I would never recommend it. It was a terrible experience and uh, it just dries out your mouth right away. It tastes like, like feet. <laughs> it's really, oh, it was wow. really nasty. Um, and then of course somebody like told on us in the class and so we had to go to the hospital and my mom stormed in and she like threatened to switch me schools and stuff, but it was, uh, so yeah, I was, I was a little rebellious, but, um, I, I never, uh, I think that was maybe the most dangerous thing I, I did. Well, it does sound a little dangerous, especially <laughs> when you're when you're that young and you're not 100 percent sure of the consequences, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was uh, not the smartest decision. Would not recommend doing it. <laughs> now, so now you're in a PhD program. Uh, yeah. So you're essentially at the height of the academic world. Do you find the experience stressful? How are you handling that? Yeah, it's. I, I find it to be. Um, enjoyable i've really enjoyed my time i like really when i first started grad school when i first started my masters um i was convinced i would never do a phd um because i really wanted to do applied conservation i still want to do applied conservation and um and i was like oh yeah i'm just going to do a two-year masters and i'm going to start doing that and then i really i just kind of really fell in love with the questions that i'm doing and with the research that i'm doing um and i really love the lab that i'm in and the people that i'm doing this research with um, and so I've, you know, for that reason, I, I've just always enjoyed the PhD work. It's been really difficult a lot of the time, really, really stressful at times, really, you know, um, really tough at times, but, you know, I've always, I always, my catchphrase is that, you know, I'm living the dream every day. Someone asks like, you know, what's up? And I'll say, you know, living the dream. And I really think that, you know, there's nowhere else I would rather be. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing at this moment, even when times are tough in the PhD. Yeah, that's a it's a good way of of uh, handling, you know, the pressures of a PhD program. That's for sure. How long do you have left? Um, hopefully, one more year. Um, I'm planning to finish next summer, um, and I'm excited to to wrap things up and start moving on to to other things. Yeah. What do you plan on mo moving on to? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure yet, um, but I'm hoping to start working. You know, I've always been interested in applied conservation and in working kind of in that realm. So I'd really like to, you know, work somewhere maybe with government, maybe with an NGO um, and being able to work more on those kind of more applied, more immediate conservation things. I really like research and it research definitely is, is essential for conservation, but it's a little, there are a few too many steps, I think, in between the research that I'm doing now and, um, and seeing an impact on the ground. Okay, so at this point, can you explain a few terms for me? The mm -hmm. first one is macroecology. What exactly is that? Yeah, so macroecology, um, we'll break that down into kind of the two, you know, macro and then ecology. Um, and I'll start with the latter one. So ecology is really the study of, um, of ecosystems, of, of living things. Um, and, and I guess it's more, um, you know, you have biology where you're looking at cells and at, at organisms and stuff and ecology is kind of a bigger you know it takes kind of the individual the individual animal or plant or, or whatever it is um, and it's looking at kind of the relationships between that individual and the environment around um, and so a lot of the time what i do is i look at you know bees and, and butterflies and other pollinators and how they're interacting with the landscape and how things like climate change and how that loss influence them and then the other part of that macroecology the macro is kind of the big picture and so a lot of a lot of ecology studies end up being or are focused kind of at, at a site or a regional level. So people go to like, you know, one site in uh, outside of Ottawa, for example, um, and they'll monitor populations there and look at how things are doing at this really local level. Um, and as a macroecologist, I, I like to focus at bigger scale. So I look at 
at countries, at continents, um, and I look at trends of of not one species, but at you know assemblages of species, at dozens of species. What's happening with those, um, all of those species across these huge areas, um, and so we end up, you know, it ends up being kind of big picture in a way. We get these kind of bigger picture trends and uh, and and ideas of what's going on, and it it lets us. Um, you know, bring our conclusions to new areas where we might not have as much data or we might not know as much what's going on. And it gives us kind of a broader stroke to, to figure out what we can do uh, when it comes to conservation. Okay, so that, that explains it a lot more. Now, you mentioned countries and continents, uh, the big picture. In your research, are you uh, looking at Canada? Are you looking at North America worldwide? What, what exactly do you specifically research? Yeah, most of my research ends up focusing on uh, North America and most of Western Europe. Um, so I focus on kind of, you know, Canada, US, Bay, Mexico, and then uh, I never, there are so many countries in Europe, I can name all the ones I'm looking at now, but most things kind of uh, east of, of Turkey, I guess, or west of Turkey um, and kind of above, uh, above Africa. Okay, and before we started recording, you told me that you mostly uh, research invertebrates. Yeah, yeah. I like to focus on the little things, I guess. Um, and I think that stems as well from one of the first uh, research jobs I had was, uh, was catching butterflies in the summer. And, um, and that was absolutely as fun as it sounds. We were running around. We, we had a, you know, a network of sites that we went to around Ottawa and the outline area. And uh, but we just spent the summer driving out to these sites um, and uh, and catching butterflies with the net, you know, a lot like SpongeBob catching jellyfish in the in the cartoons. Um, and it was such a blast. But it also kind of opened up my eyes once you start looking for like butterflies because they kind of they're everywhere, but they tend to like fade into the background for most people, I think, or definitely for me. Um, but once you start catching them, you realize that they're everywhere, um, and you start to pick them out more. In the, you know, when you're out for a hike or when you're, you know, even walking through the city. Um, and so since then, it's been not just butterflies, but, you know, little things like, um, like grasshoppers or like praying mantises or, you know, little spiders, like little invertebrates like that have, uh, I feel like this whole world of invertebrates has like open, been open to me now um, since that moment. That's amazing. Uh, why, why were you catching butterflies? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it wasn't just for fun. I can, <laughs> although it did become a, a fun thing to do after that I enjoyed. Um, but we were so the lab that I work in um, at University of Ottawa um, for a long time had this uh, network of of sites they would monitor butterfly populations at, and so there were about twenty five sites that we would go to around Ottawa and the surrounding area, and um, these sites were some of them were in kind of really pristine. Um, forested environments, others were in more agricultural regions, um, and some were in parks in the middle of the city. Um, and so over time, like, you know, a few, I think, I think we've been there for over 10 years now, um, probably longer. Um, and so we've been able to build up this idea of the butterfly communities that were there over time, and, and hopefully we'll be able to see kind of what this proximity to, uh, to human use and kind of uh, human activity, um, what impact that has on these communities. So were you researching their survival rates? Were you researching their population? What exactly were you looking for? Yeah, so specifically we were looking at trends in, in abundance of the butterflies and in kind of the number of species in the communities there. Um, so every time we went out, we would have like a standard kind of walk we would go on through the site or um, a standard amount of time that we would spend there. Um, and we would just you know record all the butterflies that we saw, um, if we didn't know what it was, we would catch it and, and identify what it was. And, um, and in this way, we can build kind of a profile of the communities there um, and, you know, what species there are there, uh, how many of each species are there. And so over time, we can tell, you know, what are good years for butterflies? What are bad years? Um, are they related to climate or, or are they not? And, um, and are they related to that proximity to agriculture or to, to human um, land use? So now I have to ask, have you ever found a butterfly that hadn't been identified yet? No, I haven't. Um, I found butterflies that I couldn't identify, but uh, they've, they've, they've been named before. Um, and uh, I think in North America, you would, at least in, in Canada and the USA, you would really struggle to find a butterfly that hasn't been identified. Um, 
but in places like South America or um, or Indonesia, um, you know, I think every day they're, they're pulling out different butterflies that people have never, never written down a name for or never seen before in their lives. So, um, or at least in, in never seen before in science. So. Okay. So they've mostly been cataloged in, in Canada. Yeah. At least in Canada and, and the USA. Okay. And so what can butterflies tell us about climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, they can tell us a lot, um, you know, like a lot of other animals, butterflies um, are, you know, where the places they live uh, are in a lot of part determined by the temperature of that place. Um, so especially given that they're kind of cold blooded insects, um, like reptiles or like amphibians, um, butterflies, their, their body temperature depends on the environments around them. So on cold days, they're not able to fly. Um, they need to let the sun warm them up and then they're able to kind of move around and, and do what they need to do. Um, so when things are too cold for butterflies, that's that's bad. But also when things are too hot, they're not able to cool themselves down. They can't sweat like you and I do or they can't pant like a dog would and release heat. Um, and so, uh, so butterflies are really kind of at the mercy of the environment around them. Um, and so they can tell us a lot when it comes to, you know, that, that means that they need to when temperatures change, uh, when climates change, then butterflies need to adapt to that and they need to either, you know, change their behaviors to move to, you know, spend more time in the shade um, or they need to move to different regions. You know, if a, a region gets too hot, if the climate is just too warm and for too much of the year it's, it's too hot for the butterfly, then it'll have to move somewhere else or it's not going to be able to reproduce. So by tracking these kind of the movements of communities and of species, um, we can kind of tell something about exactly how climate change uh, impacts the animals. Well, yeah, I was going to ask about uh, monarch butterf butterflies specifically. Mm -hmm. I tend to see them a lot in September. Are they like a fall creature? Yeah, they're kind of, um, so monarch butterflies are, you know, really well known for those epic migrations that they do of like thousands of kilometers. Um, and, and so they, you know, they all breed in, in Mexico, actually, is where they spend the winter. Um, and in the springtime um, and kind of the summer, they make their way up across North America. So they'll travel thousands of kilometers from, you know, a few scattered mountains in Mexico um, all the way up to, to Ottawa and, and Montreal and, um, and a few other and, you know, elsewhere across Canada. Um, and, um, and just because of that distance, because they're traveling from, you know, across this, across a continent, um, it means that we only really start seeing them. You know, midway part through the summer um, is when they first start entering kind of Canada, and, and we see them around Ottawa at least. And um, and in the fall is when they, and then they'll kind of lay their eggs here uh, on milkweed plants. The larva will hatch. Um, caterpillars will, you know, eat the the milkweed and and eventually uh, turn into butterflies. And um, and then they kind of get ready to make their uh, trip back to Mexico. And so. That means that, you know, that ends up timing around the fall, um, kind of around now, actually, um, or early September, when all these butterflies are preparing to make the trip back down to Mexico. So if we were to see them leave sooner or later, could that be an indicator of climate change? It could, yeah. And so there are a lot of really cool programs, things like Journey North um, or, uh, or eButterfly, which are, you know, tracking the migration of these animals over time or, or the sightings of these monarch butterflies over time. Um, and so over years, we can kind of see that, uh, you know, whether they're starting to migrate sooner in the year or later in the year um, and, and kind of what might be influencing those, the timing of those migrations. So, you know, a lot about all these reports and, and re, uh, all this research. Do you have any red flags for us? Is there anything that we should be aware of in terms of um, changes in butterfly habits? Oh, yeah. Uh, good question. Yeah. I mean, so one of the things that we see is that um, butterflies are are tending to be actually quite good at, at tracking climate change. So as the climate has warmed over the last few decades, especially in Canada, a lot more is quite warmer than it used to be. Um, butterflies have have been pretty well able to kind of move up north with, that, with those warming temperatures. Um, so as temperatures are getting warmer, places that used to be too cold for them, um, they're able to now move into those new regions. Um, and this is really great. You know, this is like the ideal of what we would hope. Um, 
this kind of, you know, we kind of presume that in the southern ends of those where those butterflies live, things might now be getting too hot for them. Um, and so they might not be able to live like as well in those regions. And so it's really good that further north, they're able to like move into new habitats and regions. Um, so that's a really, really good thing and a really positive thing to see. And it's not true for all butterflies, but for a lot of them, it's the case. Um, but interestingly, it's not what we see with things like bumblebees. Um, so bumblebees don't seem to be moving, moving further north. Um, they're, they're losing a lot of ground in the southern ends where things are, are becoming really too hot for them. Um, and unfortunately, they're not moving north, so their ranges um, are being kind of shrunk like an accordion almost because of climate change. Yeah, bees are a hot topic. They've been a hot topic for the last few years, I find. Uh, what's going on with the bees? <laughs> yeah, uh, we might need more than an hour for that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, the bees, uh, what's going on with them? It's, it's tough. Um, you know, generally, I think I'd break that question into two parts um, because there are, you know, almost two groups of bees, one of which people always think of and is always on their minds. Um, and when they say bees, they're usually talking about these ones, even if they don't realize it. Um, and that's honeybees. Um, honeybees are, you know, a really popular topic, especially now with people starting more and more beehives and stuff in quarantine. Um, and honeybees are great. I love them. I love honey. Um, honeybees are really important for agriculture and for um, pollinating farmland and stuff. Um, but honeybees are, you know, domesticated animals, basically. You know, they live in these these hives that we in some cases ship across the country sometimes. Um, and so they're really cool animals, but essentially they're like, um, they're like cows or sheep basically. Um, and so honeybees are facing the, some struggles of their own as well. Things like colony collapse disorder. Um, but these are, you know, relatively manageable. It's, it's pretty easy to start a new honeybee hive or to bring in new honeybees from somewhere else. Um, and because they're a domesticated animal, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, but the other group of bees that are in trouble are, are wild bees. Um, and this is where things get, I think, a little more worrying. Because these wild bees, things like bumblebees, um, things like leafcutter bees, which are these really shiny metallic bees you might see sometimes in the summer, um, these bees are, are really essential for our wild landscapes. They're really essential for things like tomato and squash, a lot of crops that they end up pollinating. Um, and they're also in decline across a lot of the world. Um, and bumblebees, you know, across North America and Europe, these bees are, are declining quite significantly um, over the past few decades. Um, and this is due to a lot of things, but I think the big things are probably habitat loss, um, climate change, uh, pesticides, and, um, and then parasites and disease. Yeah, bumblebees are one of my favorites from, you know, growing up in Northern Ontario. Actually, the street where I grew up, there's a huge field. A lot of wildflowers, a lot of bumblebees. We used to like try to catch them when we were kids. It was crazy. <laughs> I see so few of them now. Uh, does urban sprawl play a role in, in the fact that we see so few bumblebees these days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, you know, it's hard to imagine that it wouldn't, right? I mean, um, bumblebees, like a lot of other pollinators, like they need wildflowers, right? They need to forage pollen and, and nectar to bring back to their um to their hives and their queens and um and without um and you know urban sprawl kind of deprives them of that right um we might have kind of garden flowers and other things but um but it deprives them a lot of a lot of those natural flowers and um, and uh, and natural resources that they need um and the other thing that urban sprawl ends up doing is is destroying a lot of the nesting habitat for these bees and a lot of the overwintering habitat as well. So for a lot of wild bees, they, um, they kind of hibernate for the winter. Um, so usually just the queens will find a, you know, a little alcove or an old, an old uh, mouse nest or you know, dig a hole somewhere, um, and they'll, they'll spend the winter there. Um, and similarly, in the summer, they'll come out and they'll find a, you know, some spot to build their, build their nest and their colony. Um, and you know, that's kind of a black hole in, in our understanding of bees. We don't know where they end up making a lot of these nests in a lot of cases. And so it's really difficult for us to tell, you know, when we're building a house or when we're building a subdivision, what, what should we keep there um, for these bees to be able to overwinter and, and nest? Um, that's a difficult thing for us to figure out. And, and so I think a lot of urban sprawl ends up depriving bees of that habitat as well. 
Yeah, let's talk about that for a second here, because I actually didn't know that bees overwintered in the ground. So if that's the case, what should we look for? So let's say I'm, I don't know, let's say I buy a property. I want to make sure that I preserve, you know, the local uh, invertebrate population. I want to make sure that my bees are safe. Um, what should I look for? How do you know where they're nesting? Yeah. Um, and that's it. It's a, that's a really difficult thing to tell, even for trained scientists. Um, it's a really difficult thing to tell. And so, you know, I think the best advice that I can give for that is to try to try to keep things natural. Um, a lot of bees, a lot of bumblebees and stuff nest in the ground. Some bees nest in, in trees or in kind of substrate like logs or rotting logs on the ground. Um, and so the best thing you can do if you're really interested in, in helping wild bees and, and wild pollinators um, is to leave, you know, part of your lawn or a part of your garden or the whole garden kind of more natural. So planting natural wildflowers and, and local wildflowers, um, leaving leaf litter on the ground in the fall is a great thing. It provides a lot of cover for bees and stuff. Um, and, you know, if there's a log that falls down or you have a tree that you need to cut down, you know, maybe leave a couple of logs of those on the ground as well. Um, and that provides a lot of that kind of natural um, diversity of, of structures and, and diversity of vegetations and, um, and kind of hidey places, uh, for lack of a more scientific term, that bees can use to either nest or, or overwinter. Yeah, that's a good idea. There is, however, that the problem with bylaw, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know some people who personally who got in trouble with uh, their local municipal laws because you're not allowed to have an unkept yard. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you have any recommendations for people who want to do that in that situation? Like, I think maybe making little gardens would work. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great, a great compromise. Because um, obviously, it's, you know, not always the nicest thing to have a, an overgrown lawn either, right? Um, but yeah, keeping it contained to like, a, you know, a garden, maybe a portion of your, just a portion of your lawn that's set aside, um, that can be both aesthetically pleasing and give you a little bit of lawn to set a sprinkler in and run through in the summer and stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, so what are some other pollinators that you study? Yeah, so I also study uh, butterflies quite a bit and, uh, and then a little bit of, of other bees and stuff as well. But the big ones are kind of bumblebees and butterflies. What about moths? Oh, yeah, moths. Moths are, I always end up forgetting them. Um, and I feel so bad about it because moths are so, so freaking cool. Um, and they never get enough love, I think. But they are absolutely amazing, often overlooked, even by me, unfortunately, but absolutely amazing. Now. Yeah, one of the things I actually want to do, because they're my favorite, my personal favorite, mm -hmm. I've been debating, you know, uh, or I'm actually planning when I'm going to have more income to actually cr uh, create a moth art gallery, uh, just in my, you know, in, in, in my future man cave, so to speak. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, moths have um, so much interesting history in mythology and all those things. But do you also study them for climate change? Yeah. Um, so, so I don't. Um, but, you know, other people do. And they're really also important indicators. Um, you know, there's a really classic example of, uh, you know, to, to speak to the importance of moths for like, um, in kind of climate change research or global change research more broadly. Um, there's this really great example of, I think, in the UK um, a couple of decades ago when industrial pollution was really bad there. Um, there was one species of moth in the, in the forest that, you know, usually had a white, it had a, a, a coloration that allowed it to, um, to kind of blend into the bark. Um, and so it was kind of a lighter color that would, you know, blend into the trees and it would be pretty, you know, almost invisible or well camouflaged against predators. Um, and then there was so much kind of industrial pollution in that area, a lot of smog, a lot of like um, soot that ended up being laid down on these trees um, that these lightly colored moths would end up standing out like really badly on the trees. Um, and so they would get picked off almost immediately by birds and other things. Um, and so the whole coloration of this like population of moths ended up changing to more darker coloration. Um, and in this way, they were like able to blend in better to those soot covered trees. Um, in the forest. But, so they're really great indicators um, of, uh, of kind of global change and, and in a similar way to butterflies can tell us a lot about climate change or other factors. Okay. 
Uh, I watched an interview with you on YouTube. I think it was for your school. I can't I can't recall who who produced it, but you said in that interview that you had the tools to predict the rise of of extinction. Um, but so I'm curious uh, that that thought hadn't been expanded upon. So I wanted to bring it up here. What kind of tools do you guys use to predict uh, extinction extinction in, in local uh, species or national species? Yeah, um, so that's where kind of the beauty of like big picture ecology comes in, I think, is that what we can do is, you know, we can look at, at um, you know, what's happening to the species of butterflies or bees across, um, across a country or across a continent um, and across a really long period of time. And we can kind of tell, you know, what's happened in the past, what's happening now, how is that related to the changes in, in temperature or in human land use um, that have been happening at the same time. And what we can do is kind of build these these predictive models of, you know, we can predict, you know, when the temperature is a little hotter, um, this species tends to be more likely to go extinct. Or when uh, when humans tend to, you know, increase their agricultural land use, then this species tends to do better, actually. And so with macroecology, because we're looking at so many species and across such a large area, we can kind of build these, like, you know, predictive models of, uh, of what will happen kind of in general with things. Um, and then we can apply that to more specific regions as well. So we can go more in depth in a certain spot, and we can look at the trends in temperature because we, you know, those are pretty easy to measure by by weather station. Um, and we can look at the changes in land use because those are pretty easy to measure with, you know, records of uh, what people are doing or by satellite even. Um, and then we can tell something about what's happening with the biological populations there. Um, and that's the really difficult thing to measure, right? It's really hard to catch butterflies for years. Um, especially in a region where you didn't think it was important before. Um, and so by building these predictive models with kind of this big picture approach, um, then we can go to new regions where we don't have a lot of people looking for things or, or we don't have any capacity to, to search or monitor. Um, and we can get an indication of what species might be doing there. Are they doing well or are they doing poorly? How might we be able to step in and help them do better? But what point uh, do you actually step in? Like how, because science takes a long time and I think most people don't realize that. So let's say you're seeing a decline in a certain species of butterflies, um, let's say in Eastern Ontario. How long does it take to actually go from noticing the change to actually needing to ring some alarm bells about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if it has a really great answer. Um, Unfortunately, uh, it would be really great to say that, you know, we were, we were able to keep really close tabs on all these species across Canada and, and be able to tell, you know, when they're starting to decline really precipitously. Um, and in a way, we have that, you know, in a way, um, there's the, the Committee uh, for the Status of Endangered Species and Wildlife in Canada, CASIWIT. Um, this is kind of the governing body that, that tells Canada when species are, are in need of protection. You know, it ranks species that are endangered or vulnerable or, or at risk um, from uh, from either human actions or from climate change or from, from whichever. Um, and this governing body will will let um, policymakers know that, okay, this species is in trouble and we need to protect it. And then policymakers and governments can step in and say, okay, we're going to protect this species. We're going to do this and this kind of action to, to protect the habitat that it's in or um, or kind of remove the threat if they can. Um, but that's, you know, a really difficult process and it requires that somebody is looking at that species already and they're, they're remarking on this decline and they have in some way been able to measure like a baseline level of, uh, of abundance or, um, or of that species, um, to tell that it's declining. Um, so it's, yeah, so it takes a lot of time and it, at the end of the day, it requires, you know, monitoring a species or a region and knowing that something is in decline there. Do you find that um, people listen to you? <laughs> As in, you know, scientists uh, often don't get the recognition or don't get the ear of politicians. Um, so do you find that, you know, when it comes to species that might be nearing uh, extinction or that need to be protected, is it um, is it an arduous process or are you, you know, is it easy to actually go to the groups that work for, you know, the protection of, of creatures and, uh, and, and immediately action is taken. How does it work? Yeah, that's a good question. And, 
And to be honest, it's not one that I have a huge amount of experience with. Um, most of my experience in kind of conservation is more on that, the science end of like, you know, building these tools, but it will still probably be a while before we can, you know, actually take these tools into the field. So a lot of my experience there is more limited, but it's, I can tell you, you know, it's very easy to find people who care a lot about this. Um, and that's really encouraging for me to see. A lot of the time they speak about how difficult it is to get policymakers to act and, and to start getting actions on the ground. But it's really encouraging that there are, are so many people that really care deeply about, you know, the world around us, about nature, um, about protecting everything from birds to butterflies to, you know, spiders. And, and so it's really encouraging that there are so many people dedicated to that. Yeah, it's actually really good, too, that uh, bees are on everybody's radar. I don't know how they got the funding to do all that messaging in the past few years, but it's been really huge. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, it's really like amazing to see. Um, and it's, it's so happy as well that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of places like Toronto has a really great pollinator plan um, that focuses on wild pollinators as well. So they have, you know, do a really great job working with, especially some researchers out of York University. Um, you know, they've done a really great job of, of prioritizing kind of wild bee health um, and, and habitat for those wild bees. So, yeah, it's, it's really encouraging to see. And I'm really happy every time I tell people that I work with bees and their face just like lights up and they're like, oh, man, I, I love bees, too. And it's awesome. Definitely one of the best uh, model organisms in terms of, of people's uh, excitement. So are you the cool guy among your friends? Are you, <laughs> you know, how do people feel when you tell them you're a scientist? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, you know, obviously in a biased way, I, I like the cool guy, but um, you can make your own conclusions about uh, the guy at the bar talking about bees. So, but um, I, yeah, I, I love bees. I'm, you know, definitely of my friends, the the one who's taking longest on the hike because I'm stopping to take a picture of a, of a flower or a dragonfly. Um, and sometimes my cool points get docked because of that. But uh but I really like it. And, um, you know, it's, 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 I think people really care about nature and they enjoy, you know, learning, learning these things a lot of the time. So it's, it's cool that, that science is cool. Absolutely. It's definitely gaining traction these days with COVID. I think more and more people are finally going outside, yeah. uh, when they can, I guess, <laughs> uh, you're into photography as well, aren't you? I am. Yeah. I really enjoy kind of capturing those moments and like, you know, the beauty of, of different animals as well. What, what are your favorite things to photograph? Um, yeah, I love, I mean, I love bees and, and butterflies. Um, that's, I think, where my heart will be. But, um, but I love birds as well. I'm really, that's really been growing on me, especially in the quarantine, like being able to go out and, um, you know, and even in March, like, you know, in the very early things, being able to see like first when it was just kind of the winter birds, a lot of these chickadees that cardinals that, you know, stay in, in Ontario for the whole winter. And then it was really exciting to be able to see slowly, like more and more birds that, that have begun, that had begun to come up from their migrations from further south. Um, things like yellow warblers and, and, um, and other things. So it was, it's been really fun for me to like go out and, and photograph these animals and also, you know, feel a little more part of nature and tracking their, you know, their behaviors and, and seeing them come up. So you're learning a lot more about birds too. Yeah, yeah. It's I never thought that that uh, the quarantine would would help me do that, but it's been a lot of fun doing. It. Yeah. I have a, a stupid question for you because I recently posted a video of two blue jays at a bird feeder, mm -hmm. and there was one blue jay that kept uh, knocking down all the seeds. And I remember watching them when I was a kid because we had a huge bird feeder as well. And somebody asked me on Twitter, why, why do they do that? And I, I think, I suspect it's because they really like the sunflower seeds. Do you agree? Yeah, I think, I think that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah I don't I, know for sure, but that sounds like the likely thing. Okay. I just figured I'd ask, maybe you know more about it than I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. You mentioned right. the, the quarantine. How has that affected your morale? Oh, yeah. That's been, it's been tough. Um, it's been really tough. In, you know, obviously working from home is, is very challenging. Um, most of my research is, is computational. And so I'm doing a lot of work mostly on the computer. Um, and so it's something I can do from home, but, uh, but, you know, kind of mustering the discipline and, um, you know, especially with the lack of kind of coworkers around me has been really challenging. Um, 
And so, uh, so it's been difficult, but, uh, you know, I've had two students that I've, I'm kind of mentoring and, and training this summer that are starting their honors undergrad projects in the fall. And, um, and that's been really fun and helps me kind of stay engaged with, with the research quite intently, um, in terms of keeping them on track for their projects and stuff. So it's been, it's been challenging. Um, but I've been definitely less hit than a lot of people who have had to, to scratch field seasons or, or they have been locked out of their labs and experiments. So I'm really thankful that, uh, that I have been affected to a lot less of a degree than some people. Are you uh, more of an introvert or are you more of a people person? I, I fall somewhere in the middle. I definitely need kind of time to recharge my social batteries, but, but I have a lot of, a lot of friends. I really enjoy, you know, hanging out with people. And, um, and so I definitely, I would say I'm, 70% an extrovert and uh, maybe 30% an introvert or something. Okay. <laughs> uh, I also know that you are really into music. Oh, yeah. 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 Tell me about uh, what kind of music you like to listen to and what kind of music you like to create. Yeah. So I love, I guess my, you know, my passion has always been rap and hip hop music. Well, I say always, but, you know, kind of the first passion was you know the cds that my parents had things like luther vandros you know the jackson five those were like the cds that i grew up with um that's the good old school stuff yeah yeah and it's oh man that you know luther vandros dance with my father cd that's it's got to be one of the greatest of all time for me personally um but uh but yeah so yeah rap and hip-hop though you know that's it's just such an exciting genre there are always new things happening and I know that's the case for all genres, but it's it's especially fun when it's kind of immersed so tightly with you know things like basketball and and memes and other kind of you know distractions and, and social media and culture. So um, that's just so much fun, and it's been a you know actually such a great year for hip hop as well in terms of like some really great albums that that have come, been coming out. Um, so I've been really happy with that. Um, like what? And I, like what albums? Oh yeah, I mean. So one of the ones I've been playing quite a bit recently, actually, is the Run the Jewels album. Oh, yeah. Um, that was you know, perfectly timed in terms of when it came out. Yeah. And uh, very much a vibe for 2020 right now. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, Run the Jewels never disappoints. And um, yeah, that was a, just a spectacular album. Um, what, what's his name again? The guy who's... Um... LP or Killer Mike? Killer Mike, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, I've watched so much Killer Mike interviews, uh, you know, <laughs> as of late, and just you know, Run the Jewels is just uh, amazing. Uh, uh, do you ever listen to any old school rap? Uh, a little bit, yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I've always been hung up a little bit on the production of the old school rap. Like it's such, I don't want to call it simple because it's like really, you know, the beats they have are really, really great sometimes. But it's like such a different production era that I've. You know, it's kind of, um, it feels very dated to me, but, but no, I still love like the, uh, you know, um, you know, like obviously, you know, the Dr. Dre is, you know, the classic NWA public enemy. I took a hip hop course once in, in undergrad as like a, as a, uh, just an elective course. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, we listened to a lot of like cool Herc and like, uh, the Sugar Hill Gang. And that was like incredible. Like it was so cool to follow the history from like the birth of hip hop um, outwards. But what's your, do you have an old school band to recommend? Well, actually, I, I mean, I grew up listening to Wu-Tang and Queen Latifah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, back in the day uh, and Herbie Hancock when he was spinning. So, oh, okay. yeah, really, really. I mean, I 80s kid. Right. So uh, yeah. but I do recommend a French rap. If you've never okay. listened to Fran to rap out of France, mm -hmm. it is beautiful. It's like poetry. It really is uh, just. Uh, I'll, I'll send you some links. I'll definitely send you some yeah, links. Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now I know that you also produce, or or do you or do you do vocals? Do you produce it? How, how does it work? Yeah, I've so I've dabbled in kind of creating um, rap tracks as well. Um, I guess the most substantial effort I've done is um, last year. And my a few friends and I like um, we ended up doing this kind of diss track competition or like round robin. So we, there was five of us, and every week we would kind of draw names out of a hat, and one of us would be dissing the other, and then we'd have a week to respond and create a response track. And so that was like 
just so much fun to be able to, it, you know, it was kind of a throwback to like, it reminded me of this, the mixtape era and kind of the 2010s and like 2000s when rappers would just like, you know, jump on like old beats and stuff and, uh, and kind of, just, you know, low key remix tracks. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. You know, we were just having fun on the, on the tracks and stuff, but, but I'm still, you know, I, I maintain, I've said this for a while, but it's, it's going to happen. I'm going to drop, you know, a mixtape. It's going to be, you know, hotter than climate change. And it's, it's going to, it's going to make some moves, you know, wait for it. Yeah. You know, it's on the way. So you're coming back on the podcast when you release that then. <laughs> Definitely. hundred <laughs> percent. And the last thing I had in my notes was that you're into basketball. Now here's the deal. I was a huge basketball fan, but I'm, again, I'm old school. So that was back in the day with Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan. And I mean, I was a huge Lakers fan. So the Bulls were like the enemies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so who's your favorite team and why? Oh, Toronto Raptors. Easy, easy pick. Um, I, you know, absolutely love the Raptors. I used to have a picture of, uh, of Vince Carter on my, um, in my bedroom when I was younger. Um, and he is, I think, probably the greatest Raptor of all time in my mind, um, just for that dunk contest. Absolutely nasty. Um, but watching the Raptors win last year was, was so nice to see. I mean, they're an incredible team and watching them play this year as well. I still think they can, if they end up restarting the season, um, then I, I still think the Raptors have a really strong chance of, of taking the chip again. So I'm really pumped to see that. Have you ever been to a game? I actually have not. No, I've been to a, um, a university game in the States, a couple of university games in the States, but I've never actually been to a, an NBA game. But, hmm, maybe that should be on your bucket list soon, huh? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I would have, I would have put it on the list last year. I would have definitely gone to one of those championship games, even though it was absorbently priced. I would go just to stand in Jurassic Park, I think, but I ended up being in the UK the whole playoffs, which was, of course, the one playoffs that we win um, so far. What were you but, doing in the UK? Uh, research. It was a, a research trip to uh, University of College London. Um, I'm, I've done a lot of my PhD work with a group there. And uh, so I spent four months last year um, at the university, staying at the, uh, the Center for uh, Biodiversity and Ecological Research, CBER. And uh, absolutely great, terrific department, terrific people. Um, and we got to do a lot of exciting research. So that was a lot of fun. That sounds really cool. So do you get to travel a lot with your program? I do. Yeah. And that was one of the big perks. Probably the reason, one of the biggest reasons I'm still in grad school is that, you know, there's, we don't get paid very much at all. Um, and, but, you know, we get to travel to conferences and, you know, to research trips if you can, if you can manage it. So uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've had, you know, been absolutely, you know, so blessed in terms of that. I've, last year I went to South Africa as well um, for a scientific conference in Kruger National Park. And that was absolutely amazing. Um, I've gotten to go to BC and take some extra time and drive around Vancouver Island. I've been to, uh, you know, the southwestern United States, to Albuquerque, and then been able to do some camping in Colorado um, because of scientific conferences. So it's it's been absolutely, that's one of the biggest perks of grad school, I think, is being able to find exotic conferences to go to and, uh, and get them paid for. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Are you calling Ottawa home? Or do you think that you want to live elsewhere after you're done? Um, I'm definitely calling Ottawa home for now. I really love the city. Um, I really love the people in it. And, um, but I'm, you know, I really love traveling. Uh, I really love kind of exploring new places. Um, so I could see myself leaving next year, depending on, you know, what, what type of job opportunities get offered to me or, or that I can find. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. But for now, Ottawa is definitely home. Very cool. Well, Peter, it's been so much fun getting to know you and uh, getting to know a lot more about uh, your area of expertise, about your hobbies and your interests. And it's just been nice to learn that for, you're from Northern Ontario, I have to say. <laughs> I'm still astounded by that fact that I didn't even know uh, going into this interview. So it's nice to, to really connect with you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much for having me on. It was an absolute pleasure to chat with you, especially knowing that you're a fellow Northern Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and definitely, I definitely want to have you back on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to push your buttons and get you to to do that music stuff because, <laughs> uh, you, you know, as much as we want to focus on 
academic inve- endeavors. I think uh, it sounds like music is a big part of your heart too. So I say go for it. Yeah, thank you. Definitely do that. And I'd love to come back and hear uh, your tracks. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.